it's so easy to disqualify people. And I know companies are desperate to disqualify in order to surface the best applicants. But I, I've only ever used my own eyes to determine if someone was worth talking to. And I haven't made all the best decisions, but I feel like I've hired some pretty great people. You know, so I, I am a proponent of not using AI for HR related matters, personally. Yeah, I understand that. I think we still have too little data available. Of course, that can also change if we have a lot of data of course the program can be because you said it can be programmed by a white guy 40 plus you can also argue that you make sure that you have diverse programmers in programming an ai system to make sure that they are not discriminating against race gender whatever and then you have to think of course which eliminates the most is it is the is it the human judgment or is it the ai because maybe we're thinking about okay ai should be perfect well once ai is better than an average human judgment Tom for Bolvin is Mercer Talent Enterprises Senior Director. And his job is to go into other companies that are looking to assess potential leaders at the executive level to determine who is the best fit. In this conversation, we talked about what is his job like? What does it mean to assess someone? What are the biases that could potentially come up? What are the potential noise pieces that could come up? Things like, are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they hot? Are they cold? These kinds of things. Things that can be negatively, things that can negatively impact the experience uh, or the uh, way in which someone gets assessed. We talked about AI and its use in HR and hiring and the future of what AI might look like and so much more. This is episode 202. I hope you enjoy it. What makes you interested in assessing human psychology out of anything else you could be doing? Oh, it's actually a career path bit by accident. I'm, I'm, I'm a sociologist as a background, and I just rolled in this in this profession. I remember I was in a sabbatical because my wife was uh, working for the International Committee of the Red Cross, and I was a headhunter at the time, and I was a bit fed up with that profession, I, my wife had her first mission. Uh, I followed her sabbatical, and then I saw a job description, and I thought that that's pretty cool. Let's 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 call the CEO CEO of that company. And I called him. I said, Oh yeah, actually we're we're looking for someone. Let's have a chat. I didn't have a clue what I, I, I stepped into. So. When it comes to career planning, I'm not the best example uh, in the world, Sean, but that's how I found actually my, uh, my passion because it's a super exciting job that I'm doing by accident. So I rolled into it. So then what was it about that post that made you said, I can do this? Or maybe yeah. you didn't say I can do this, but maybe you're like, oh, yeah. let's, let's, give or it let's, a go. Or let's give it a go. But there were a couple of elements so that was like, uh, was an international dimension to it. Uh, so a lot of traveling and I'm excited about the traveling part. There was the, the the people, the human aspect of it. I'm always interested. I'm, as a sociologist, I'm more like observer of dynamics and, and, and a bit of an outsider. Um, and it was actually, I don't remember exactly, but it was a pretty cool job description. Uh, so I, 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 there were two, three elements. That I thought, yeah, let's do this. And so how many years have you been doing this? Um, now almost purely so 10 years in a company called Cubix, which is now Telogy, and then eight years in PwC, and I just started at Mercer, so almost 20 years that I'm assessing leaders, assessing and developing, but more assessing actually to be, to be fair. So what goes into an assessment? Depends. Um, because of course you start, you want to measure a leader against something. You just don't go in, okay, is this a good and a bad leader? So you need to first define what we call a success profile. And of course, that's really interesting because what, what is good leadership? If I ask a hundred people, you'll probably get a hundred different answers to that. So mm -hmm. typically companies have competency profiles, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the, that's the very challenging part because what kind of leader do you need? What kind of leader brings you to success? And that's different for each company. And I imagine that you've experienced instances where a company has a competency profile or a success profile, and you look at it and you go, this is not what you need. You've incorrectly profiled your ideal candidate. Happens a lot. Yeah. Old competency profiles. Uh, yeah. Totally not fit for what they're doing. Not fit for future. Happens all the time. So 
how is it that they come to create an incorrect profile and how do you determine that their profile is incorrect or correct? So it's, it's, of course, it's a collaboration. I cannot tell them what's the perfect profile. They know their business better than I do. So there you have discussions, you challenge. Um, sometimes they have created a lot of competency frameworks for different levels, super complicated, um, not easy to measure. So it's kind of a collaborative approach, but you, as a consultant, you do challenge them on what they have. Not always. You have uh, you have uh, companies doing it really well, but most of the time you need to challenge and ask questions uh, why it is in. So, do you go through the profile before anything else, or do you go through the profile after kind of understanding their goals? Like, how do you come to the decision that the profile is correct or not correct in that regard? I guess it would be more specific. Yeah. So you st basically you start from your mission and strategy and values. That's the core. What's your mission? What strategy? I mean, the strategy is very important to decide on your success profile of leadership. And then it depends, of course, which level are your board level, CXO level, or a bit below. So that depends. And then also does that profile under, like underpins the values you have in a, the culture you want to have in, in the company. But of course, it's all pretty, you want to have clarity, but it is, the, there is a philosophy. I was, it, it's a bit of philosophical discussion. What, what is the culture you want? What is culture you shape? How much fit? Because you also want to sh change the culture maybe. So you need someone who kind of fits in, but not fully. So, so that person or that leader can change the, so there's, there's a lot of, um, discussion around what is now the ideal success profile of that specific, uh, leader. So you said that it's collaborative and that you work as part of a, a company. So is there a strategist that comes in before you or with you before you're able to then start assessing or are, are you, are you the one that collaborates directly with the company to assess the profile? Like how, how does that work? I like, are you come in before, during, after that kind of assessment. So how it works, if you have the success profile ready, after, and sometimes it's just a, an hour call, sometimes it needs more time. If you have that, that's our base to decide how we're going to assess the leaders. For example, if we decide like, I don't know, creativity, innovation is super important as a leader in this company, then we think, okay, how can we measure creativity or innovation? And then we can come up with, for example, a business case or psychometrics or something or, or abstract thinking. I don't know. So that's, that's the base for deciding the assessment tools we're going to use in that, in that specific case. Does that make sense? Do you ever create your own tools, your own metrics? Like, because you have a background in sociology, like, are you doing experiments and publishing the results based on these things and then coming up with frameworks? You know, is there something special that you bring specifically? Yeah, so we do create our own psychometric tools, our own business cases, because that's it's very tailored towards the company. Uh, it's always you have generic psychometric tools like personality questions or, or abstract thinking or reasoning tools. But for example, a business case is something we most of the time, especially at the leadership level, uh, develop tailored, totally bespoke for, for each client. And then of course we do research on what is now the perfect profile of what is, for example, what is a high potential, what, what makes people move up quicker than other people. So we do a role of research around, around that. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that there's certain positions that are changing in the eyes of the global market. Like for example, a CEO in the nineties is different from a CEO today. And you may come into a company where the CEO of a public company has been around for 30 years and what people expect of a CEO has changed. And so now the company has to go, this is what we want. And you're like, that's not what a CEO is supposed to do anymore. If you want your company to survive the next 10 or 15 years or 20 years, based on your average hiring time for a CEO, yeah. like you got to change the role. Um, you know, there's like a, chief security officer right. or something that's like becoming new roles. something new 
uh, you know, they didn't have it before. So maybe they hire you to assess a CEO and you're like, well, hold on a second. You don't even have a security officer or like you don't have a diversity officer. Or you don't have this. Like we need to. So do you does you and your do you and your team kind of come in and also look at that and say, oh, you don't have this. We should talk about that. Or do you kind of just leave it? Yeah. So we challenge them and then it's up. It's always up to them. It's like we assess someone and then we give a recommendation, but of course it's up to them to 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 decide. Uh, but we look at the org structure if it makes sense. We look at strategy if it makes sense. Uh, but that will be a different assignment. So I have colleagues who do org design, for example, and I say, okay, you you have to look. You should talk to my colleague who is specialized in org design, and then I bring the specialist in uh, rather than because yeah, my my expertise is, uh, is behavioral leadership assessment and not org design but of course yeah we've seen so many companies that yeah we do have something to to say so what does a typical client look like typical size or you know are, are they public are they private you know do they have a thousand employees do they have 50 employees like what what do they kind of look like most of the time it's it's let's say public private uh, can be both, um, uh, but most of the time it's the, the larger companies that we're working for, typically uh, Fortune top 500 companies, uh, large government organizations. Why can't they do this without you? That's a very good question. <laughs> but it's uh, take, for example, you have to assess a new CEO, right? Let's give that example. It's probably one of the highest risk board members need to take. And we see from research that it's success, one out of two. It's like flipping a coin. They do it, board members selecting a new CEO is not something you do every day, hopefully. Yeah? Hopefully they stay a bit longer on board. So it's they have to do a job that they don't have really experience and they don't have the expertise. Why would you do to, for example, take so much investment in due diligence in your financials and not in selecting the new CEO? Because the the risk of doing it wrong is enormous. I'll give you an example. A good and a bad. Look at Boeing. Right? They had a culture of safety, of quality, because if, if you make it a plane and it goes wrong, you have a big issue, reputation. They hired a new CEO, didn't fully embrace the quality safety first, and you have a lot, a lot of problems with the quality of the planes, even 300 dead people. So Boeing choose the wrong CEO and their share price went down Big time. They lose a lot of money. I cannot tell you how many, but I can guarantee you they're losing a lot of money by selecting the wrong one. But you have examples that go the other way. I worked, I started my career at IBM. This go back to the 90s, Sean. This is a long time ago, but IBM at a certain point, they choose a CEO, Lou Gerster, and he didn't come from the, uh, from the technology sector, uh, but they wanted to have someone who was much more customer focused. And by selecting Lou Gerstner, and there was a couple of board members who exactly like your questions, they challenged, like, why do we need the technology? Let's analyze what we really need. And they had the guts to choose for a, a bit of an atypical CEO for a company such as IBM. And he took them from a three billion loss to, I don't know, eight, eight million uh, profit in, in a couple of years. So. So the importance of selecting a CEO is, is huge. And then to come back to your question, why would they hire me? Because it's my day-to-day -day job. Why would you hire a, a, a financial expert? You hire someone who, who knows the job, who is doing this like a, like, like almost like an, on a daily base. So how long do these assessments usually take from, like once you've figured out the profile is correct, is it your responsibility to go and talk to headhunters and find these people or is it the company's job? And then they go, Hey, we found someone. What do you think? Like, how does that kind of uh, process part of the process work? The sourcing is done by or internal by 
maybe they have one an internal candidate or they go to headhunter and then it's external candidates or a mix of both so that depends but we're not intervening that because we want to give them an independent uh, piece of advice so then how long does it take also that depends it's a it's a it's a funny fact that as a graduate you probably spend more time in being assessed than a ceo because there is a perception of okay that woman or or man went was already a ceo so they're probably intelligent they probably know what they're doing uh so they spent two days assessing a graduate and and one hour or a couple of conversations with with the board so that's the that's a bit the unbalance in in this but if we come in what we normally try to do is like half a day of of, of assessment because of course you don't want to going to days it's, it's also not very realistic but half a day i would say that's that you can do a thorough assessment and give give proper robust um recommendations i figured it would have been like a few weeks yeah because you were saying you you can't like you you were saying that you take more time to assess other people usually than the board or an executive. Yeah. So I figured, you know, you would assess someone for longer. Right, it's the other um, way around. My only real experience, my only real experience with hiring executives was for my software company. And to be fair, we all, uh, we had experience not as executives. It was our first time being executives pretty much. And because we couldn't afford yeah. people who had the experience. Um, and, you know, I think it's quite common for startups. Fair enough. So I had to learn how to assess the people I was hiring. Because, I mean, I, I have a degree in psychology and I hired a lot of people before for different companies that I founded or companies that I worked for. But I had never hired executives or I never hired someone for an executive role. So it was like totally different. Um, and I'd say for the the person that I hired as a managing, uh, sorry, as the, the marketing director, he had marketing management experience and we were, we wanted him on track to become the CMO. So we want, there's like a year and a half or so that he was in the director role. So we're like, all right, we'll give you a bump in, in the position. Um, but we won't start you as a, a CMO cause we're just not sure. And I think we talked to him for probably a month before we hired him. But these are discussions. So what I'm talking about is half a day of assessment as such. So that doesn't, I'm excluding a discussion with board members, interviews with the company, etc. So a purely four hours assessment uh, where we focus on the leadership qualities of that specific person. So the, the real, the full hiring can, can take much longer than that, of course. And so you go on site for the this assessment each time, or at that level, most of the time it's still physically in person. I'd say the most of the assessment now changed a lot since COVID. Of course, uh, it's it's sure. virtual, but at that level, there's still a preference for in person uh, assessments. Yeah. And so typically. If the person is not living where the office is and you're not living with offices, you're both kind of flying in or they're already there because they've already been in process with them or or it's effective to have an interview with one of the board members and then let's let's be effective and do the assessment at the same time. And that person's been in that location and you've been in that location long enough where there's no sort of jet lag or any sort of thing where your energy is low that might affect their performance. That's a very good question, Sean, because you 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 do have that what we call noise. I don't know if you're from your psycho psychologist, psychologist as a background, but you have Kahneman. Are you familiar with Kahneman, the behavioral scientist? He died this year, I'm afraid. He wrote a book. Kahneman? No, he wrote a book. It's called Noise. And he did a lot of research. Hey, just give me 10 seconds of your time. I really appreciate you listening to the episode so far, and I hope you're loving it. And if you are, I would love to ask you to subscribe to the channel because what we do is a lot of work. And every week we bring you a new guest and a new story. And what we do requires so much love. 
so that we can bring you something amazing. And every week we're trying really hard to get better guests that have better stories and improve our ability to tell their stories. So your subscription lets the algorithm know that what we're doing is fantastic and no commitment, it's free to do. And if you don't like what we're doing later on, you can always unsubscribe. And either way, we would love a like if you don't feel like subscribing at this time. Thank you very much, and we'll take you back to the show now. Exactly that. So you have a jet lag, or even it can be as simple as your favorite sport team lost. And he did research on uh, judges, like how severe they judge people. And it's amazing the difference between the winning favorite team or the losing favorite team or even having if they've eaten yeah, yeah. or if they've had coffee yeah, exactly and if they had coffee how many hours no, ago was amazing it? Yeah. and so that you have to get that noise away or, or the, the 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 airco they have airco it's a hot day and there's no airco and they're sweating you will be much more severely punished uh if you have a judge who's uh who, is, who doesn't need to judge in an airco space so that's very important yeah, but to answer your question, so what are we doing now against that? Because of course, you have bias and noise. Eh? So bias, it, you're pretty aware, but noise, you, it's not something you're always aware of. Um, so you have to take into account a pretty strict process to avoid uh, noise. But still, it's... Um, you try to mitigate it, but it, it's never a 100% uh, waterproof process because things going on in your world. What are some ways that you try to mitigate noise? For example, same timing, for example, um, same kind of questions. It's almost like mathematics. Um, if you score someone to do it on a, like you, you almost don't want to quantify uh, stuff and you want to make the, sh the process is fair and that it's equal for everyone who's going through the process i feel like that's more towards bias no instead of noise yeah but like if you have trained assessors like myself you you're very aware of, of your own own biases so that's why you take an external so in that sense we don't typically we're trained to not be biased and again i'm still biased <laughs> but I'm professionally keeping myself busy on not to be biased. Um, and if we talk about noise, it's more about the, the, the process as such to avoid that noise. Right. So uh, an example of noise could be the company offered you guys meals and one of the meals was too spicy for the candidate. How do you know that it's too spicy for the candidate and that it's affecting their ability? Because like their mouth is on fire, right? And and then you give them yeah. water, and then the water makes them feel like they need to go to the bathroom, right? How, so how how can you be aware of these things, and how can you communicate that with the company and with the candidate so that everybody knows there's like no noise or, or very little noise? Yeah, but you can, for example, say every interview is as just before lunch, then at least. Wouldn't that make them hungry then? And the, yeah, the, then, the later into right before lunch, the tired, more the more tired they feel and the less likely they are to respond yeah, but then, fairly. It, because it's for everyone the same 11 o'clock. So it's for everyone the same. Like the judge, the, ass the assessor will not be, will have the same feeling of hunger almost. And of course you cannot take into account maybe they skip breakfast or not. You, you know, so there's, there's always elements in it. You cannot eliminate noise. So that's impossible. But you can put a process in place that, that reduces the noise. Right. For example, I love to play table tennis. And usually I play on Sundays and I'll play for two hours. And I will fast from about 6 or 7 p.m. the night before until about 1 or 2 p.m. the next day. So I will play table tennis with no, no calories and a little bit of water. And I know that I don't perform as well as other people that I play with who have eaten. And I, I don't tell them, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm hungry because I didn't eat. No, it's my decision to not eat. Um, 
So I'm sure you may have people that are that fast or are used to fasting when you're like, oh, make sure you have breakfast before you come so that you have the energy for the test because lunch isn't until noon. And they could go, well, I'm used to fasting, so that doesn't affect me. So in terms of bias, you could, for example, potentially have someone that they're like, look, we've got five candidates, but like this one is the one we like the most, right? right? Do you tell them like, hey, don't tell me, uh, you know, if you have any favorites, keep that to yourself. No. Explicitly. I don't they, want to know anything. But do you decide what order to interview people or do they tell you the order they want? Cause that could also have some sort of bias. Cause the first one could be the one they like the most, or it could be the person they don't like and they just want to get them out of the way. Yeah. So just to be clear, Shanta, so that this like in optimal world, you have, a clear, you, you, you put them all at 11 o'clock every single day. No reality kicks in. Mm -hmm. We we foreseen one day for the interview, so you start at ten and you have a slot at eleven and a slot at four p.m. Uh, so that's the reality doesn't help or efficiency doesn't always help. So yeah, of course we are asked and to to adapt and and we not always go and say no. That's not the because we we need to eliminate no. So yeah, reality kicks in there. So. What are some other things related to noise and bias that we're missing, maybe, that we could touch on? That we can improve? That we can improve or that we just haven't mentioned that is interesting, something you've learned or that we didn't talk about? Yeah, it's. I think that's also linked to the whole AI discussion, Is is and that's a bit the problem with AI. If you AI will use, I mean, they will probably keep the bias. Uh, if you look at leadership again, who are successful CEOs, then you end up with a wide male 45 plus. So that's then your success profile in your AI system, excluding women uh, and reinforcing positive. So, but then you could say, okay, if you are very aware of that, then we can influence the AI system. So maybe AI might be a solution. But then again, I'm, uh, I don't know. I'm also not an AI specialist, so I don't know, but it could, it could, if very well designed, it actually could exclude bias in an ideal world. So I'm not an AI expert, but I love talking about AI. And I've had a number of conversations with people who are focused on marketing or they're focused on sales or customer service or product. And we talk about AI and what is currently happening in their vertical within you know, business. And... I haven't really talked about AI so much in HR, just a little bit. And the the consensus I have gotten from experts in, that, that are involved in HR is that AI should not be used because, as you mentioned, you may get a thousand CVs and if it's a female and the AI is biased against females, you might end up with zero female applicants. Even if you say, I want female applicants, or, well, females aren't good at this job because they're female. Males typically do better. So um, I'm only going to show you males. Um, and they may say, oh, uh, the AI may have been programmed by a white guy. And so you may only get white men in their 20s and 30s who are young and, and uh, open-minded, right? And so you lose all, all of the other people that would be there. Um, so I feel like AI has a a really long way to go and i feel like ai you say ai has the potential to remove bias but i think ai has really only the potential to make bias worse because you're enabling someone who could potentially be racist or potentially be sexist or potentially be ageist to program the thing that's going to determine the future of the company and the applicants that it sees and you know, someone could miss a, a period or an exclamation mark on their CV in, in their opening message, and that could get them disqualified. Oh, they're they're messy. Oh, they're they're not uh, clear about what they want because they they missed this punctuation. Like it's it's so easy to disqualify people, and I know companies are desperate to disqualify in order to surface the best applicants. Mm -hmm. But I I've only ever used my own eyes to determine if someone was worth talking to. And I haven't made all the best decisions, but I feel like I've hired some pretty yeah. great people, you know. So I, I am a proponent of not using AI for HR related matters personally. 
Yeah, I understand that. Uh, I think we still have too little data available. Of course, that can also change if we have a lot of data. Of course, the program can be, because you said it can be programmed by a, a white guy, 40 plus, but you can also argue that you make sure that you have diverse programmers in programming an AI system to make sure that they are not discriminating against race, gender, whatever. And then you have to think, of course, which eliminates the most, is it, is the, is it the human judgment or is it the AI? Because maybe we're thinking about, okay, AI should be perfect. Well, once AI is better than an average human judgment, we should stop using the humans and use AI systems. Of course. But who determines what is good judgment? <laughs> yeah, still, yeah, exactly. But I, you can, I, I think it's, a, it's an ongoing process in the sense that you have independent researchers who then look at, does this, does this work? Yes or yes, or, yes or no. At the moment, I will, I will not use AI at the moment, but maybe in five years, I will have a totally different opinion. Right. I, I always continue down this rabbit hole of questions because you say, oh, there's, well, there's researchers who are the researchers who hired them, who determined that they were the right people to do that research and make those decisions based on the data that they were given. You know, it's so easy to be unsure that I would always err on the side of questioning the results and questioning the people and questioning their motives. Because you say, oh, we could have a diverse group of developers that are coding the AI, but how do we know that they're diverse? How do we know that the company is not just saying they're diverse, but they're not? Yeah, because you don't know what the algorithm is, of course. Because that's all hidden. Yeah, yeah. Right. It, most of these algorithms, there's different weights and and measurements and we don't know how they're designed we don't know what they're looking for we don't know why they're looking for them we don't know how they work so, so how are we supposed to trust them i personally don't really use ai for anything no because it's it's scary i mean there are certain things that you're forced to like the youtube algorithm the the google algorithm for search um you know there, there's some things you have no choice yeah. but uh you know, I don't use a Google Assistant. I don't have a Siri. I don't have an Alexa. Yeah, I don't use Assistant. I, I don't use ChatGPT. I've tried it. Like, I know what it is. Uh, and I know what it can do. But I just, I don't. I mean, like, I'll I'll use a generation machine for um, timestamps for my YouTube channel. But I also then have to go back because it's so awful and like turn it into one word or two words. Like I have to look at the results and then fix it so that it's human readable. Yeah, but I think if you use AI, you always have to double check and quality check, et cetera. But it can help you be more protective uh, in, in some cases. But I'm also ra rather skeptical around the, the hiring with AI. But it's... Yeah, I think we're going to use it more and more, especially in, on the, 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 you know, if you have thousand applicants, are you going to do all the interviews or are you going to use an AI system then to, to sift and then end up with two, three interviews at the end of the day? Also risky because you exclude certain type of people. Um, like, yeah, I think higher if you tried it once with non I don't know if you know higher views this interview platform and then you talk to uh, the camera so you don't have human interaction and then they they assess the tone of voice your facial expressions um, based on that that's not fair because i'm not good at smiling that doesn't mean i'm not happy or i'm not enjoying myself i just yeah. don't smile that much but that that fired back for higher view so yeah so they were they used technology good yeah, exactly. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I think the more we learn, the more we develop. Uh, I think at a certain time, my job will be replaced by an algorithm, so I'm afraid. I have to think of my retirement. You are not wrong for thinking about that 
and I applaud you for being open <laughs> to the idea that it's a possibility because there's a lot of people that have no idea that AI is coming for their job. Mm. And when I first came out of college, it was about 16 years ago. AI wasn't a thing. Smartphones weren't a thing. The internet was like, you know, still kind of, you know, Facebook was, when I finished college, Facebook was like, it was 2008. So Facebook was be, like becoming a thing then. And people didn't really think about, oh, I need to reinvent myself. They thought, oh, I'm going to go to school for this. And, you know, I'm going to spend my career doing that. Like my dad, you know, he's been a dentist his whole life. That's what he was trained to do. But my generation can't afford to do that. And my dad even is like, they are using stem cells now to like regrow teeth. He's like, we're not going to, you know, dentists aren't going to be needed. He's like, the next generation is, is screwed. You know, they're, they're going to be out of work. Lawyers are going to probably be out of work. Doctors are probably going to be, able to, there's going to be so many things that AI will be able to do. And before the end of the century that so many humans are going to be unable to work. And I think it's going to cause a huge problem economically, globally speaking, if you couple that with the uh, kind of deglobalization and uh, just less humans being born. So they'll have, there'll be less people to do jobs and there'll be less jobs for the people that are alive to do. So where is everyone going to get the money to buy mm. things to keep capitalism <laughs> going? Let's go, yeah. so I, I, I seriously, I, I look at the rest of the century and I, I don't know what's going to happen mm. and it's kind of scary. I think because I don't know where we're going. No, me neither. I have an idea, um, but I hope it's not. I don't, I don't ever, I don't <laughs> I hope it's, it's not going to happen. But I think we have to embrace, uh, that's a bit of a paradox, but I think we have to, um, to, to be end very human, but also embracing technology. I, I, I think both. I think now it's going more towards technology. I think what we miss is just like a good conversation. Also at the work, like, Look at how many calls you have. Everyone is, the attention span is like, nobody's following. Everyone is on their emails. They don't listen anymore. Communication. So I think there's a high need for, for, for just having a serious conversation. I think there's a high need for more philosophy in our, in our world, even in the workspace. But that, there'll be an NI for that. <laughs> but at the same time, <laughs> We have to embrace technology as well, as long as it's, 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 it's human. We need the human interaction. Uh, and that's also, I think, my job as an assessor. Technology can help us in giving up some data points, but we always need this, this a conversation, always. And also putting myself as a candidate, I would, at the mo I, I would hate it to be assessed by a computer or an AI system. And even if it was fair, I would never feel like I'm treated correctly. Or so I need as a candidate also a conversation and a good conversation, not a 10 minutes, uh, like, Hey, what's your motivation? Why you, or like, you know, like something more depth. I think that's, what, that's what we're missing sometimes. Big depth. There was one interview that I did where I asked ChatGPT to look at the profile of the guest yeah. and all of the things that were on the internet about them and come up with a series of questions that they would have never been asked before. Okay, yeah, interesting. And and then I and then I told the guest, I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'm not going to tell you if it was written by me or an AI. And I want you to guess afterwards which ones were from me and which ones for the AI. And he got about half of them right. And I was like, okay, that's interesting. But I also, I, it took me a few rounds of coaxing the AI to give me interesting questions because the, the first round was like, I, I could ask those questions already without knowing anything about the guy, right? Basic human stuff. And then like the second one around, uh, the second round was a little bit better. And th I think it was the third round where I was like, okay, these are like starting to get interesting. I don't really want to spend any more time on this. But I never did it again because I always feel like the human thing is it's 
it's good for your brain to like just sit there and listen to someone talk and then think about what they're saying and how it affects you or how it doesn't affect you or how it might affect the audience and what you might want to know from them that I just don't think an AI is capable of at least yet, at least not yet. But it might help so, you in getting better into your questions. Maybe, but I'd rather not use it. <laughs> I'd rather use my mind on, use because, mind because the thing is and put them together. It can be. The thing is my style is I don't like to prepare anything. Because if I prepare, then I'm not going to be flexible because I'm going to have these questions and I'm going to want to ask these questions and it's going to change the outcome of the interview. Because my goal is to always have the guest feel like it's unique for them, that they're not going to have this kind of an experience with another podcast if they go on another one. And when I use the AI, I'm kind of... You know, I can say, I can ask things I might normally ask and not ask things that I don't want to ask because the, the guest is different than the other guests. And so this thing might not work with them or this thing might work with them. And, um, but you, you know. can, you even have AI who says like matching profiles that tells you at the spot. Okay. But talking to Tom, uh, best way to approach him is, I don't know, ask detailed questions. I've seen uh, those. I've, I've seen those. It. Uh, so I, I don't remember the name of this tool, but it's uh, connected to LinkedIn and it gives you a psychographic profile of, or a psychometric profile of people that you're going to contact, like cold outreach, or if you're going to interview them or whatever. So I, I've seen it, but I've barely used it because um, I don't, I don't do a lot of cold outreach, but it was interesting. And I said, well, yeah, you know, I normally look at this stuff too, but I, I don't normally look at someone's LinkedIn profile, look at the words they write and think about what kind of their personality. If I, if I needed to, I could, but I try to reserve my brain power. So I, I don't like to do that if I don't have to. Um, I like to just kind of, as you know, like have this intro call and get to know them through that and then use that information to make the interview happen in a way that's as fluid as possible. So as natural as possible and spontaneous. Right. Because you were saying humans need long form conversation. So if I have a series of questions that I'm prepared to ask you, then it feels not really so much like a conversation. It feels like an interview and an interview feels like work. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want to, I don't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. I'd I agree with that. <laughs> I'd rather play, you know, it's uh, almost 5 PM here. Like, I've been working all day. I don't really want to work. I want to, I want to talk with people. So for me, like the natural yeah. fluid, flexible aspect of it is what I enjoy. Yeah. So in all of your years of doing this, almost 20, what is the most important thing that you've learned about humans? <laughs> oh, that's um, that's a hard question. I've seen so many people. Everyone is so different. I think that's that's the that's that's the first. I think it's also if we talk about leadership, what is good leadership? I think we have we can talk about it for for a week. I think the one thing that that is very important is, is the in integrity of the. the of leadership, I think that's it. that's an important point. Um, and people can be so different in so different situation. Can have the most asshole, toxic leader, and he's the most lovely dad in the world. Uh, so it's very complex. That's 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 what I learned. And the more I I, I know, the more I feel like I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's it's so impressively complex and that's only individual. So if when interaction with other people comes in, it becomes even more and we are social human beings. So there's always interaction and dynamic exchange all the time. So it's a constant, it's, it's, it's never linear. It's always complex. And that's also the beauty of it. I, I think 
I'm not sure if that answers your question because that's not my, what I learned about human beings, but special, spe special species, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah.